first speaker today is uh, Dr. Mary Wood. Uh, Mary is the uh, Wyoming State Wildlife Veterinarian, so she's our home base here for the state of Wyoming. Uh, and under that um, title, she supervises the Veterinary Services Branch for Wyoming Game and Fish and the uh, Wildlife Health, Health Laboratory. Um, she oversees the wildlife disease surveillance programs, the, Ta uh, the Thorne and Williams Wildlife Research Center, and chairs the Wyoming Game and Fish Department Chronic Wasting Disease Management Team. So obviously her focus is uh, CWD, but under that role she also participates in uh, all the free-ranging and captive wildlife disease research that goes on here. Uh, she's uh, had a focus in the past uh, and currently on respiratory diseases in bighorn sheep, and uh, she gets involved in all, all of the regional and international CWD collaborations that um, come her way. Um, her other expertise is in animal uh, anesthesias, and um, she oversees the department's work in that uh, department as well to make sure we're doing that appropriately. So with that, I'd like Mary to come speak to us. So while we get this loaded up, I just wanted to thank you all for being here today, and thank you for inviting me to come and speak. I'm going to start things off uh, hopefully relatively simple and easy, and I just am going to focus on our chronic wasting disease surveillance in Wyoming and just look at what we have seen with chronic wasting disease in our state over time um, and some of the things that we've really learned from that and some of the questions that we've probably developed out of looking at what is happening on the ground in our state. So early CWD, you know, we don't really have an introductory presenter who's going to actually give the basics of CWD, but um, certainly this is a fatal neurologic disease. It has been identified in free-ranging deer, elk, moose, and reindeer. Um, and this disease is caused by a prion, so it's not what we're used to, like a bacteria or a virus. Um, this is a protein that is sort of abnormally folded. And the very nature of that disease agent makes this so challenging to understand, and it makes it really challenging to try and understand how to manage it, because this prion can accumulate in the environment, and it can be an infectious in the environment, as well as from animal to animal. And that makes this really challenging to try and address. As far as Wyoming goes, um, you know, chronic wasting disease in general was first discovered and described in the late 1970s. And our first cases in Wyoming were at our captive research facility in Sabeel Canyon in the 1970s. Um, when we did some more surveillance and looked a little bit further, we did identify our first free-ranging case, which was in a mule deer in 1985. And that was followed pretty quickly by our first elk case in 1986. Now what I'll say is those are the first times we detected CWD in free-ranging populations, but we do believe that by the time we even found CWD on the landscape in Wyoming, it had likely already been here for decades. And it had already been here for quite a long time before we even knew what it was to discover that. So um, that, that makes it a little bit even more challenging for us in Wyoming as we look at management. So in the 1980s and early 1990s, we did start doing some preliminary, preliminary surveillance, mainly as a research effort collaboratively with Dr. Beth Williams, um, really looking at some early data, trying to see what was going on with CWD. Our agency surveillance program probably didn't get going in earnest until around 1997, and I'm sure you can see that um, over time, our surveillance, our sample sizes increased and then by 2003, we were able to get some federal funding to support surveillance in our state. And that helped us get a lot more boots on the ground, get a lot more data across our state, and start to get a better feel for what we were seeing with chronic wasting disease. And we had that federal funding through 2011, um, so we were really able to get quite a bit of good data during that time frame. Um, after 2011, that federal funding went away. Um, Wyoming Game and Fish has maintained a commitment to continue surveillance, however we certainly do continue it at a much lower level than we were able to do with federal funding. And as a result, starting in 2012, we also shifted our surveillance focus. So rather than every year trying to survey the entire state to see what's going on with CWD, we really do focus on the western front of CWD and looking at movement of CWD in our state 
as well as we also focus on our sort of core endemic area where we feel we've had CWD the longest so that we can monitor what happens over time with CWD in those areas. So we are no longer really surveying our entire state intensively for chronic wasting disease each year. We just don't have the people to do that. Now you may notice I have a little star at 2016. So that data is very preliminary. We still have seasons going. We're still getting samples into our laboratory, so we're still collecting more data. Um, but as you can see, we certainly have increased our samples this year. We've already collected over 2,600 samples. And that falls into our CWD management plan and trying to um, enact some of the things that we said we would do there. As we saw western spread of CWD, we would increase some of our surveillance. So we have made a much bigger effort this year to try and get some more data on chronic wasting disease. So when I do talk about our surveillance program, we kind of have three main components to that program. Um, we look at hunter harvested surveillance, and that's probably what most people are familiar with, and that's the vast majority of the samples that we look at. And so that's, of course, voluntary entirely. Um, hunters that were willing to let us take a sample, we'll take those samples and we'll test them. And that's our closest ability to try and look at prevalence of CWD on the landscape. So it's our best ability to try and look at a relatively random sample of animals from the landscape. That being said, it's still probably a little bit biased. Um, we still do think that CWD positive animals are a little bit more vulnerable to harvest than negative animals. So even our hunter harvest surveillance may be a little bit biased and in some ways may overestimate prevalence. Um, the next type of surveillance we look at doing is roadkill surveillance. So we do know also that CWD positive animals are more likely to be hit by a car than CWD negative animals. And so we do survey roadkill animals. However, we feel that's even more biased than hunter harvest. So that doesn't really reflect a true prevalence of CWD on the landscape. But what it's really helpful for is looking at spread and certainly looking at early detections in areas where we're, perhaps we haven't seen CWD before. And we may be more likely to see that in roadkill samples before we see it in hunter harvest. And then the third type of surveillance we look at is targeted surveillance. So that's even more selective. So that's really looking at animals that are demonstrating signs that look like CWD. So droopy ears, uh, poor uh, body condition, maybe drooling, a vacant stare, things like that, that make us suspicious that this could be a CWD animal. Um, same thing goes if we see maybe a deer that recently died um, that looks really thin. We consider those a targeted sample, and certainly prevalence is a lot higher in that because those are animals we really do think have CWD. So again, that doesn't help us look at prevalence, but that really helps us look at movement and early detections. And we do tend to see new detections in areas oftentimes through targeted and roadkill surveillance before we'll see it through hunter harvest. So that's why those two are still very valuable for us. Um, they just do a different thing than the hunter harvest surveillance. Um, for our surveillance program, all of our CWD samples are taken to our wildlife health laboratory in Laramie, and we test those, and we do make those results available online to hunters. So if we sample their animal, um, we give them a little barcode with a number, and they can look up their CWD test results. So that is something that we do for our hunters. <clears throat> so in our surveillance program in total, we have collected over 56,000 samples. Um, the vast majority of those are mule deer. And then followed, of course, by elk. And then we really don't have a lot of data in white-tailed deer or moose in our state. So today I'm going to focus mainly on mule deer and elk, um, where we have more data, and it's a little bit easier to try and look at what we're seeing on the ground. Unfortunately, our surveillance data in white-tailed deer and moose is just a little bit too sparse for us to make any big interpretations, I think. So this is a series of maps just showing detection of CWD by hunt area over time. And I'll give you the caveat that probably not until about 2006 did we really know where CWD was on the landscape. So probably not until after 2006 are we really looking at potential movement of the disease. Um, and so that's just a caveat to give to you. So, and I'll point out that this is in deer. I am going to talk about elk a little bit later, but right now I'm focusing on deer. So this is our current known distribution of chronic wasting disease by hunt area as of uh, November. <clears throat> Those areas that are outlined in dark blue are the new hunt areas that we detected as positive in 2016. <clears throat> so we certainly have seen CWD 
move across our state, and we certainly see CWD across the majority of our state at this point, and we're seeing it look like it's moving westward. <clears throat> this is a map of prevalence of chronic wasting disease in our state, and this is a 10-year average prevalence. So it's, it's average from 2006 to 2015. And we haven't included our 2016 data in there because we're, we're still collecting that data now. And so as we look at that, we, you might notice on here, um, the areas that have a star on there, in case you can't see the legend, um, those are areas where even in that 10-year time frame, we had less than 30 samples. Um, so it's a really rough estimate in those areas of prevalence. And then those areas that are white, we call them 0% prevalence on this map because we did not detect CWD through hunter harvest in those 10 years. However, we did detect CWD in those areas through other methods. So we either detected them prior to 2006 or we detected through targeted or um, roadkill surveillance. And so this is quite interesting. And I guess I didn't ask, do we have a laser pointer? Ah, thank you. <clears throat> so I, there's certainly things to be learned from chronic wasting disease in our state. And I think what probably is most significant as we look is southeastern Wyoming, uh, where we think we've had CWD the longest. Um, a big portion of southeastern Wyoming is at a prevalence of 20% or above. And we certainly have some areas and hot spots where we have prevalence approaching 40%. And with that, we just have to keep in mind that, you know, this is a fatal disease. And when we're talking about deer, when deer have CWD, um, we know that they will die probably within two years. And so when we look at areas that have 20% prevalence or 40% prevalence, and we're looking at potentially the proportion of the population that might die due to CWD in the next two years, we are concerned about that. Um, and that is something that we really need to start paying a lot of attention to. <clears throat> Other things I think that are interesting here is that while southeastern Wyoming is still very much the long-term holding of chronic wasting disease in our state, we do have some other hot spots in here around Thermopolis where we're getting some higher prevalences as well. Um, and I think this is where surveillance data becomes incredibly valuable and really helpful as we move forward to try and look at where are our pockets of CWD, where do we maybe need to look at focusing management attempts in the future, and looking at where we can try and make some sort of a change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some specific herds in our core endemic area. And our core endemic area, of course, is sort of the southeastern Wyoming area. And I'm going to talk about a couple of deer herds, and then I'm going to switch and talk about elk. So the first deer herd I'm going to talk about very briefly is our South Converse mule deer herd. And I'm going to go just touch on this a bit. We're going to get a lot more information on this from Dr. Malia DeVivo, um, so I'm not going to go in depth. But we certainly have seen some interesting patterns in this herd. Um, <clears throat> and this data is quite interesting. So we do have a long-term trend of chronic wasting disease increasing in this herd. And we do have enough data in this herd, and strangely, this is the only herd that we really have enough data on females to look at prevalence by sex. And if we do look at a long-term average, our female prevalence was around 24%, and our male prevalence was around 43%. So our male prevalence in, this is mule deer, um, was about twice as high as our female prevalence. And this is a pattern that's seen pretty consistently with chronic wasting disease. It's seen in Colorado, it's seen in Alberta, and it's even seen in Wisconsin in white-tailed deer. And so just when you think that this is a really interesting, predictable pattern, of course, life will throw a loop. We do have a white-tailed deer population where we see the opposite um, at very high prevalence. That being said, we do think that this pattern probably holds true, particularly when prevalences are below 40%, when they're a bit lower, and that we probably do have males and the deer are more preferentially uh, infected with chronic wasting disease than females. So I think that's something that's quite interesting and may help in some ways to guide management as we move forward. Beyond that, the other thing that I find really interesting about this herd and I think is important to talk about is that, you know, when we first started our surveillance and started to get enough samples, you know, from this herd to even understand what CWD was, um, our prevalence was already over 10%. Um, and the reality is, is unfortunately for us in Wyoming, by the time we found this disease, by the time we had any clue what this disease really was, it was very firmly established in our state and had been here for a long time. And that makes it really challenging now 
because we are and we kind of always have been behind the curve in trying to figure out what's going on with this disease. So that's a particular challenge for us in Wyoming and probably also for Colorado um, where this disease was already established before it was discovered. Beyond that, I do think, you know, as we look at, and I'm not sure if Dr. DeViva will talk about this at all, but if you look at our prevalence, our long-term prevalence is increasing, um, but the last couple of years almost look like they're decreasing, which is quite interesting because I've seen this in, as a pattern in a couple of areas, and it almost seems to mirror some of our population dynamics. So I'm going to move on to our next herd. So, so that one was South Converse, and now I'm going to move further south to our Laramie Mountain mule deer herd and talk a little bit about what we see there. Um, and so in this herd, we still do see a long-term trend of increasing prevalence, although this looks a lot different than the South Converse mule deer herd does. We still have prevalences that I consider quite high, you know, going up into 20 percent, um, but we haven't seen it climb quite as high as that South Converse mule deer herd. And, you know, the short answer to that is I, I don't know why. Um, but the longer answer is certainly every population is different and is probably experiencing different factors on the landscape, maybe in a different time frame on their own CWD epidemic. And so what we see in each population may not be exactly the same. However, we do see CWD in this herd. We don't necessarily know that it's causing a population decline, but we are concerned that it still is potentially impacting our herd. And when I look at this surveillance data, and I look again at our last five years or so, you know, it doesn't seem like we're seeing that steady increase. And I thought that was really interesting. And I think, you know, it's important when we're trying to look at some of these prevalence data to think about other factors on the landscape. So this graph just shows the black line is our postseason population estimate for this herd, which I'll tell you right now, it's modeled, it's rough, you know, probably both with our population estimates and with our prevalence, trends may be more valuable than any individual number. The red line is our CWD prevalence, and then the blue line at the bottom is our um, harvest for that herd. Um, so what I find really interesting, I look at this and I think this is really fascinating, and there is really a story here. And I don't know exactly what that is, but it does really seem like our CWD prevalence is mirroring some of our population dynamics, um, which is quite interesting to me. So, you know, this herd is being managed for growth, so we have a pretty low rate of harvest on this herd, and we certainly saw some population increases, and then we saw around, you know, 2009, 2010, we saw this population begin to drop, and that coincided with a harsh winter and some drought conditions and a lot of poor fawn recruitment. But it seems that we also saw a mirror drop in our prevalence when that happened, um, which is quite interesting to me. It would make sense if you had a harsh winter that animals that were CWD positive might be quite affected by that, and you might drop prevalence through that. And it almost looks like now, the last couple of years, we've had really good fawn recruitment, and that population is starting to come back up. And I can't say we don't have enough data and enough long-term data to look, but it almost looks like your prevalence might be trending back up again. So um, looking at this over time is quite interesting. So I'm going to move on to elk now and uh, talk a little bit about CWD and elk. And this is a map looking at our current prevalence and distribution of elk, uh, CWD and elk. Um, and as you can probably see, this looks quite a bit different from our deer map. And the reality is, is what we see with CWD and elk on the landscape isn't necessarily the same thing that we're seeing with CWD and deer on the landscape. And this is a theme, but of course the short answer to that question is I don't know why. Um, but the long answer is, is there's a lot of thoughts as to why we might be seeing something a little bit different in elk than we see in deer. And that could be something to do with biology of the elk, something specific to the prion, to the chronic wasting disease or strain of chronic wasting disease, that could be perhaps a difference in elk behavior versus deer behavior, maybe a difference in elk management versus deer management, or maybe we're even just looking at different time frames. Perhaps we've had CWD in deer for 20 years longer than, than elk, and maybe what we're looking at in elk is just an earlier picture. Um, of course, life is never simple, so reality is probably there's a combination of factors that are causing a different picture in elk on the landscape. But I do think it's quite interesting, and I do think there's a lot of research out there that focuses on CWD and deer, and we probably need some more data on CWD and elk because it does seem like it looks a little bit different. 
Um, and that's pretty interesting. So I'm going to go, I guess, to go back. Our Laramie Peak elk herd kind of mirrors our same area as our Laramie Peak mule deer herd in southeastern Wyoming. And it's really the only major elk herd that we have, one that we have a lot of data on for CWD, and that overlaps our core endemic area and overlaps known CWD area for long term. So um, this is our prevalence data for Laramie Peak elk herd. And again, we have a long-term trend of CWD increasing in this herd, and we certainly do get enough data in elk on female and male that we can look at sort of prevalences and average prevalences over time, and um, male and female prevalence are quite similar in our elk population on the ground. And so that in itself is quite interesting because it does look different from what we see in deer. Um, what is also interesting when we look at CWD prevalence in elk over time is it's not like we're seeing a, a steady increase that just goes steadily up. Even when we have similar sample sizes in each given year, we sometimes see some variation and oscillation in, in prevalences of our elk. And of course, the short answer, I can't tell you exactly why that is, other than we do feel that chronic wasting disease is not evenly distributed on our landscape. So even in a hunt area where we see average prevalence is 10%, that still may mean that we have a group of, area of elk or deer in one area that have a prevalence of 40% and a group that have a prevalence of 2%. And we're seeing sort of pockets of CWD on the landscape and not necessarily is it uniform across the landscape. And so with that, we may see variation in prevalences from year to year just depending on where elk are and depending on where elk get harvested that year. Um, I don't know for sure that that's what happens, but we, we do kind of wonder. So again, I think it's interesting and we look at our last five years in elk data, and it also seems like prevalence is almost leveling out a little bit there, which is quite interesting. So we did the same thing in overlaying some of our data, and it does look like overall this elk herd is certainly increasing. It does look like we had a, a bit of a maybe a little population dip with that harsh winter. Um, uh, the prevalence oscillates a lot more in the elk than it does in the deer for whatever reason that is. Um, and the last few years seem to have flattened out. And whether that's associated with a little bit of that dip or we've had some big changes to, to our harvest management of elk and, you know, we harvest a lot more elk and we got a little bit more um, elk harvest later in the year and whether that's having an impact, I don't really know. Um, but we certainly are seeing kind of an interesting pattern that's sort of following true across there. And it does seem like in some ways maybe our prevalence is mirroring some population dynamics, which I think is really interesting. And I think time will, will really provide some interesting data. Or if we combine this sort of data with maybe Colorado or Alberta, folks who have also had CWD for a long time. Um, also, if you do notice, the harvest in this elk population is quite high and it's quite a bit higher than what we're harvesting for deer. And there's been a lot of discussion about this elk population, you know, even with our population estimate, again, this is a really rough estimate, but somewhere around 10,000 elk, um, you know, that population estimate is lower than the, the corresponding mule deer herd population. However, um, we do see some interesting things on the landscape with these elk, and hopefully this video will play. Um, and this just shows, at least in the northern end of that herd, I don't know if there's a way to turn the volume off. Oh. Don't really need to listen to the helicopter. But we do see a variation in um, group sizes <clears throat> in this herd. And so we'll see some smaller groups, certainly. But particularly as the winter progresses, we start to see bigger and bigger groups of herds come in together. And in late winter, we do pretty consistently see really large groups of elk wintering together. Um, I believe up to 1,700 elk have been counted in a group together. And this is actually, it seems like from talking with our biologists, pretty consistent and pretty predictable. And we do see these really big mega herds of elk um, out of this Laramie Peak elk herd. So I think that's quite interesting. And it certainly lends to a lot of questions regarding elk and density on the landscape and what that means and perhaps what that means for elk in you know, a high density on a feet ground versus elk and a high density in a free ranging situation and what differences you may see there. But for whatever that's worth, we do really see some pretty big groups of elk in this herd. So I guess my big question as I'm looking at our data from our core endemic areas, you know, why are, what are we seeing, what we're seeing in mule deer, why is that different from what we see in elk? And of course, like I said, we don't have the answer. 
but I do find it quite interesting that in any given year, you know, between 1997 and, and 2015, a uh, very, very rough estimate, but we are probably harvesting somewhere between two and seven-ish percent of that mule deer herd. And any given year in the same time frame, we're probably harvesting somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the corresponding elk herd. And just knowing that perhaps CWD positive animals maybe are slightly more vulnerable to harvest, uh, the question does sit with me as to whether the differences in the way we manage these two species might lead to some of the difference that we see in um, their response to chronic wasting disease on the landscape. Um, I don't know for certain that that's what's happening, but I do think that those are some pretty interesting differences in our management, and perhaps there's some interesting things for us to learn. You know, and like I said with the Laramie Mountain mule deer herd, we don't necessarily have any data to suggest some sort of population decline associated with chronic wasting disease, but we still are concerned at what 20% prevalence might do, especially when it's additive with all of the other factors that mule deer are facing, what that might do to our herd. And even when we're looking at flying this herd and looking at classifying this herd, it does appear that we may be seeing fewer older age bucks in this herd. So we might be seeing an impact from chronic wasting disease in that herd um, presenting itself in a different way. We don't have really good, firm, concrete data to say that. Um, it's, it's just a little bit subjective, but um, that might be a pattern that emerges with chronic wasting disease as you get into higher prevalence. So I wanted to touch very, very briefly on our captive research facility and some of the things we've learned from looking at chronic wasting disease in elk in captivity. So of course we first had CWD at our facility in the 1970s. We haven't done anything significant to clean up our facility with chronic wasting disease. And so we do see at our facility in captivity, elk are very readily infected with CWD. But we do see differences in survival in elk um, based on genetics. And so at a specific point in the elk DNA at uh, codon 132, they can have either an M or an L. And we see those that have two Ms they live the shortest amount of time. And at our facility, and Amy and Gerard may talk a little bit more about this, this is actually updated data with uh, three years of, of extra data on top of there. And we do see those animals becoming positive at our facility between 600 and 2,500 days. So, you know, between 20 months and like seven years. So it's a pretty wide range that we're seeing. Um, but certainly we do pretty consistently see them getting CWD within two to four years. And what's interesting is if we're doing periodic rectal biopsies on these elk and we're actually kind of looking at um, trying to see when CWD uh, is found earlier before they actually have clinical disease, we pretty consistently find that if we find a positive rectal biopsy on an elk, we'll see clinical disease within six months. And that's actually pretty predictable um, in our elk at this time. When we look at elk that have one L, um, they do live longer. And so we see 970 to 3,600 days at our facilities, so they do live longer. They still, of course, have a very wide range. What's interesting, and I'll, I'll give you the caveat, we don't have a lot of data in ML elk, but we have some. And when we do periodic rectal biopsies in these elk, we infected with chronic wasting disease. And at our facility, it almost seems, and this is quite subjective, but it almost seems like our survival time is decreasing over time. And I don't know if that equates to an increased environmental load and we're just getting infected earlier and in a high enough infectious dose earlier, or if that relates to maybe some changes in the um, chronic wasting disease prion itself. But um, I think there are lessons there that given the right set of circumstances, elk do get CWD um, quite readily, but why what we see here isn't what we see on the landscape um, is quite interesting, and I think we need a lot more research in elk to understand that. So I wanted to finish up very briefly talking about our CWD management plan. So we did just approve a management plan uh, this past spring. Our commission approved this plan. And we actually made quite a few changes from our previous plan. And I think, you know, one of the significant changes is we did have a goal, and we added this goal to reduce the rate of spread and prevalence of chronic wasting disease in our state. And that is a lofty goal. And I've got to be honest with you, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Um, we don't have a template, there's no prescription on how exactly we should manage our populations in the face of chronic wasting disease. There have been things that have been tried that might show promise, things that maybe don't show promise. 
And there are a lot of thoughts out there, but we don't really have anything that is steadily tried and true for managing for chronic waste and disease, which means as we move forward, we're really going to have to look at some applied research to start testing some management strategies to see whether we can find something that will work. And we're going to have to accept that if we want to manage for CWD, we're going to be managing experimentally um, and trying to learn from that. Our um, management plan does have four components, so in disease management, uh, some of the things that we certainly do are is carcass movement restrictions, um, uh, targeted removal of clinical suspects. So that's a big thing that we are starting up uh, this year. We actually have hired two positions for the feed grounds. And their sole job is to monitor elk in and around the feed grounds and monitor for sick animals in and around the feed grounds. And if we see sick looking elk, to target those elk remove them, test them, remove them from the landscape so if they're positive, hopefully they don't contribute to more um, contamination of the environment. And then they're also coordinating with Wyoming Department of Transportation to try and get more surveillance samples from road kills and things around the area. So that's something that we will be doing this year um, in and around our feet grounds, directly associated with our management plan. The other things we certainly do, which I think are quite important, is restriction on translocation of any cervids and restriction on captive ownership um, in the name of CWD is going to be pretty important, and we'll continue to do that. Surveillance in of itself is certainly not necessarily a management strategy, but is really key in the future to help guide us in our management, and we are going to continue to do that. And I think the most important part of our management plan, while it may seem quite vague, is to explore new research and management options. Like I said, we don't necessarily have a definitive tried and true strategy, we're going to need to be flexible, and we're going to need to be able to watch the research as it comes out, and we're going to need to be willing to, at some point, potentially try some things and see whether or not they may be effective. Um, our second component is research. We will certainly continue to support some amount of research in our agency through our captive facility and some free-ranging studies, as well as to work collaboratively with other researchers, providing samples, data, other things, um, to promote chronic waste and disease research. The third component would be information and education. And that's an area that we are actually really hoping to improve. Um, we've probably grown a little bit lax in the last few years on chronic waste and disease, and we're putting a new effort and emphasis on some information sharing and reaching out to our collaborators, to our public, and starting to have more discussions about chronic waste and disease. And we're working right now to put together some of that effort and see that we can start working a little bit more with our public and stakeholders regarding chronic waste and disease in the future. And of course, our last component would be funding, and funding is always a challenge, um, particularly in our current economic environment in our state. Um, you know, our surveillance program and our CWD program is funded out of our general fund. And so this year, our Game and Fish Commission was committed to chronic wasting disease and committed to supporting further management, research, and surveillance. And so they did actually fund those two positions out of commission dollars since we didn't have general fund. But I do foresee funding to be a significant concern in the future, and that's going to be a struggle for us. Um, and so I guess with that, that's about all I have, other than, you know, in the future we're certainly going to be spending a lot of time hopefully talking to our state, our public, our collaborators about chronic waste and disease. We're interested in your ideas. We're interested in working together to figure out how we can manage this in our state. Thank you very much. Um, we will have five minutes, or um, excuse me, ten minutes of questions here, and uh, it's very important that everybody be able to hear the questions. So we're going to try to get your microphone. Great, Michael, I'll have one. I'll have one. Uh, Dr. Wood, do you want to select one? Um, oh, I I've got a hand right here. Still comes. Realizing dramatic species differences, um, why are prong, for instance, not susceptible? Why are they resistant? Do you think there's any um, use in exploring that further in terms of, of management? So the question was looking at species differences in chronic waste and disease. Why don't we see pronghorn getting chronic waste and disease? And are there some answers in there? I believe that was kind of the bulk of your question. Um, you know, I think that you know all of the animals we see getting chronic waste and disease are sort of cervid species, so they're related. Um, pronghorn are quite unrelated in, in that respect, and so there's just a pretty big species barrier between pronghorn, 
in that group of cervid species. Um, as far as how that would direct management, and for what it's worth, we've actually tested pronghorn. I mean, we've tested a number of species in Wyoming on the landscape um, uh, just to be sure that we don't find it. I guess I don't know if that gives us any management answers for chronic wasting disease because I, I don't know how we would change anything as far as susceptibility of our cervid species. Um, I'm not quite sure if you were looking for something else there, but. Just to see if it would inform research at all. As to why. You know, I, I think we see this pretty consistently across the board with prion diseases, where they tend to be actually relatively species specific, with a little bit of spillover occasionally here and there. And so, you know, I think CWD is just sort of a cervid specific. Um, so I think it's a pattern that probably follows what we see with these types of diseases. Anyone else? Um, sort of a two-part question. One is um, if there is sort of agreement on transmission um, from the environment. And then the second was, I thought it was really interesting when you talked about um, well, the, the data are presented as by hunt area. And I wondered if you've been able to experiment at all with the data that you have to try to pinpoint um, at a finer spatial scale where um, potential transmission could be occurring or through our reservoirs in an environment besides the broad, like Southeast area. Okay, so I think in that, the question, the first part of that question is, is there consensus on transmission? Um, and I guess I would say yes and no. Um, we all know the different ways that the disease can be transmitted. You know, we do know that through feces, urine, saliva, um, that there can be transmission through animal to animal contact, through animal contact with an infected carcass, and we know there can be transmission through animal contact with infected environment. What we really don't know is what is the primary driver, or is there even a primary driver of transmission in free-ranging populations? So what is really driving what we see on the landscape with chronic wasting disease? Is this a lot of animal-to-animal -animal transmission and a little bit of environmental transmission? Is it a lot of environmental transmission and very little animal-to-animal -animal transmission? Um, that's, I think, a big question, and I think that's something that we don't necessarily have the full answer to, uh, whether one of those is primary or whether they're interacting together. Reality is they're probably interacting together, but we don't necessarily know in what capacity. As far as the second part of that question was looking at surveillance data, and we've looked at it by hunt area and whether we could look at finer scale data. That is something we would love to do. Um, we're actually talking about trying to sort of change the way we map our surveillance data and see whether we can actually demonstrate pockets of prevalence on the landscape. The problem is to do that, you just need an overwhelmingly huge sample size. Um, so we're going to certainly try to do what we can, but I don't know that we're going to ever be able to get enough data to get a fine enough scale to identify that, but we would like to. Okay, so I believe that question was, you know, looking at our Laramie Peak elk herd, we've seen that elk herd grow pretty substantially over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, and we've seen it grow pretty substantially with chronic wasting disease pre present. And the question is, well, do we think that we're going to see chronic wasting disease limit other elk herds um, in the future? And, you know, again, there's, there's certainly a lot of unknowns. I can't predict the future. I wish I could. But what I would say is it does seem that as your prevalence increases, your impact is going to increase. So probably populations are to some degree tolerating lower prevalences. And the question is really at what prevalence, uh, what is your threshold that you might start to see an impact? And will that population reach that prevalence? And I don't know what that might be for elk. Um, I think that 
every population is going to be a little bit different and may have a little bit of a different threshold depending on the other factors that they have. And certainly looking at CWD as an additive factor, and it can do some things on its own, but in combination with other factors can be quite significant. But I think the caveat is, is we probably won't see an impact until it reaches some sort of a critical prevalence threshold. And I don't know what that would be, and I don't know how long it would take to get there. I think if it got to a high enough prevalence, it would cause an impact. No, we still have carcass restriction. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, the question was, you know, we used to have um, restriction on movement of carcasses from CWD positive areas to um, outside of those CWD positive areas. And your question was, it seemed like that had ended. And no, that restriction has not ended. We still do hold those carcass restrictions in place. But probably as we're reaching out and talking to our public more, we're going to do a little bit more um, discussion regarding that so our folks are aware that that is still in place. We still have those carcass restrictions in place as far as movement. Any other questions? So I want to thank Dr. Oh, there's one. Short Make it quickie. Um, BSC, how different is it from the CWD prion? Do we know? <laughs> All right, so the question there is, um, how different is BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow, from chronic wasting disease? Do we really know? And I think that is probably a question for somebody other than me. I, you know, I haven't done a lot of work personally with BSE. Uh, they're certainly the same type of disease as far as being prion diseases. Um, but we see some differences in transmission of BSE versus transmission of CWD, where CWD really seems to be infectious. Um, and, you know, you get this animal-to-animal -animal transmission through a lot of mechanisms. BSE really seemed to be transmitted through uh, feeding cattle central nervous system material and brain material. So um, there are some fundamental differences in what we've seen with those diseases, though they are still in the same group. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> sure. For, in all your, for like the maps and the plots and everything for else. most of that is primarily male. So, yeah, and that means that we may be overestimating, I guess, your overall prevalence in the herd. But we just don't harvest very many female mule deer herds. So the question was, what, what is the sex ratio of prevalences that we see um, and that we're mapping on this? And that is primarily male um, mule deer that we're mapping. So um, that's a good caveat to put out there. All right, thank you very much. We just have one minute. Sala, do you have a one minute question? <laughs> uh, the question I have is do you, is there like an ideal model that you're able to establish of dealing with the containing the spread of the disease? Is there some kind of a, you know, ideal situation where if you have those conditions, you see that it would be possible to contain them or eliminate it? Okay, so that question is, uh, is there, or do we see an ideal model for how to contain or manage or eliminate chronic wasting disease? And, you know, I, I don't necessarily know exactly what that would be, but, you know, when you look at disease eradication, there are specific criteria you look for, and unfortunately, chronic wasting disease doesn't meet those criteria. Um, so, you know, in order to really contain it and manage it, we're going to need some effective tools. And we're going to need some ability to monitor those tools. If we wanted to eradicate it, we would need to have a disease agent that didn't survive in the environment. We would probably need to have a disease agent that had a really effective management tool for eradication. So right now, I don't really see us eradicating the disease, but I, I don't know what the ideal tools are to manage it. We hope to find some. We should all thank uh, 